Tonight, the fallout after more than 30 tornadoes in three states. At least two people killed after a powerful tornado touched down in Alabama. Homes and apartment buildings damaged. Search and rescue teams going door to door looking for possible victims. And the threat now has moved east. Rob Marciano will time this all out for us. The move tonight by Congress to avert a potentially devastating rail strike and keep rail workers on the job. But not all Democrats are on board. The possibly dire situation tonight for American Paul Whelan, who has been wrongfully detained in Russia for nearly four years. Is he in a Russian hospital tonight? His brother joins us for the latest on the push to send him home. Tonight, tens of thousands of Iranians are taking to the streets. Our in-depth report on the painful loss, but also the renewed hope for change. We are not uh, going to sit and listen to someone. We are going to be our own voice and we are going to have the democracy. Tonight, new concern as the eruption of the world's largest active volcano now threatens to cut off a critical highway that runs through the middle of Hawaii's Big Island. The star, known for their role in The Crown, opens up about their newest project and the important life lessons they hope teaches us all. Be who you want to be and follow that drive and that curiosity to find out more about yourself and follow where sort of that will leads you. Tonight, we are celebrating the life of a beloved artist behind some of the biggest hits of the 1970s. Tell me lies, tell me sweet little lies. Good evening, I'm Stephanie Ramos in for Lindsay Davis. Thanks for streaming with us. We begin tonight with the severe weather from coast to coast with 30 reported tornadoes across three states in the past 24 hours, killing two people in Alabama. The dangerous system is moving up through the Northeast as a major new snowstorm is winding up in the West. This twister was one of the ominous sights seen over Louisiana, Mississippi, and Alabama last night. Today, families sorted through the damage of their homes and farm buildings in Mississippi. And in eastern Alabama, some families are left homeless after a tornado destroyed the roof of their apartment building. As we track where the severe weather is moving next, ABC's senior meteorologist Rob Marciano leads us off tonight in Alabama. Tonight, the system that spawned nocturnal twisters across three states is on the move. I'm right inside the circulation. More than 30 reported tornadoes in all. In Caldwell Parish, Louisiana, flashlights piercing the darkness as they desperately search for survivors. At least two injured there. In Alabama, just after 3.15 in the morning. It's rapidly moving eastward. So Wetumpka, you need to be in your safe place. You got this storm approaching from the west. An EF2 tornado. Winds up to 120 miles per hour. Touching down north of Montgomery sending trees crashing into homes, ripping apart others, debris hanging from utility poles. This is what's left of a community center. Tragically, that twister killing a mother and her eight-year-old son, a relative identifying them as Chiquita Broadnax and Sidarius Tell. The boy's father rushed to the hospital. I think the tornado really just came very, very quickly in this case. In Utah, Alabama, a different twister making a direct hit on this apartment complex. Look at all this building material just everywhere. Up there, a four by eight piece of plywood impaled on that tree. This is where kids would normally be playing, but the walls and roof of those bedrooms blown out. Amazingly, no one here seriously hurt. Kathleen Jones rode out the storm here with her three kids. So it came through, you heard it, You're, mm -hmm. and, and what you and My your kids- My was shaking. What'd you do with your kids at that point? We All I could do was just grab them up, and we all went into the clubs, and I just hold them out and cover their heads. And all I was just saying, well, God, please help her. That's it. All I could do was just call on Jesus. Their home now condemned. Let's get straight to Rob Marciano in Alabama. And Rob, the damage is widespread across multiple states, and this system is now moving east. Time this out for us. 
All right, well, uh, look, it's, uh, it's moving quickly, thankfully. The tornado threat is winding down here, but obviously the damage already done. The building you see behind me, it's now condemned. It's got hit by one of 10 EF1 or higher tornadoes, and we'll see probably more of those uh, confirmed tornadoes tally up during the day tomorrow. But tomorrow is going to be a different day for just about everybody. Tonight, a different night for folks who live in the Northeast. You're getting the rain and the wind, difficult air travel, difficult driving. The rain will end from west to east tonight eventually, but the wind will not. We're looking at uh, high wind warnings and advisories across the Northeast and parts of the Great Lakes. Throughout the day tomorrow, it could see winds gust to 50 miles an hour in spots. And a lake effect snow warning is up off of Lake Ontario, north of Syracuse. Could see it well over a foot of snow as the cold air piles off the Great Lakes, calming down for a day or two. But right now, the next storm up is already pounding the Pacific Northwest with heavy rain and, and mountain snow. Seattle to Portland, down I-5. Winter storm warnings are posted for the Cascades, the Siskiyous, the Sierras, and then through the Bitterroots as this thing will press not only to inland, but I think the front gets all the way down into Southern California. So everybody on the West Coast gets a piece of this. One to three feet of snow in the mountains. And this one has some punch to it and enough legs to it to where it'll be another system that affects everybody in the lower 48. One more that's going to go coast to coast. Stephanie? You're tracking quite a lot. Thank you so much, Rob. Next, to an emotional plea from a family urging parents to monitor who your children are talking to. It comes amid chilling new details about the former Virginia State Trooper accused of posing as a teenager and driving across the country to pick up a teenage girl, allegedly killing her family and burning their home. ABC's chief national correspondent, Matt Gutman, has the latest. Tonight, family members pleading with parents across this country to know who their children are talking to online. Parents, please, please know your child's online activity. Ask questions about what they are doing and whom they are talking to. Anybody can say they're someone else. And you could be in this situation. That is authorities in Riverside, California, revealing more about the former Virginia State Trooper who allegedly posed as a teenage boy driving cross-country to meet a 15-year-old girl in person, then allegedly killing three members of the girl's family and setting fire to the house. When I had arrived at my house, we had learned that something more tragic had happened. Police say the bodies of the girl's mother and grandparents were found in their burning home, their hands heavily duct taped behind their back. The 28-year-old Edwards then drove off with that 15-year-old girl, leading police on a chase and a shootout. Tonight, an autopsy revealing he took his own life. The girl was unharmed. Our thanks to Matt Gutman for that update. Next to the ABC News exclusive with Sam Bankman Freed. He's the founder of the now bankrupt crypto exchange FTX, and he sat down with George Stephanopoulos amid multiple allegations of fraud against him. Take a listen. This is really a yes or no question. Yep. Carolyn Ellison says you knew that FTX funds were being funneled to Alameda. Did you know that? I knew that there is an open margin position there and that that involved. I know, but that's not what I'm borrow. asking. <laughs> I didn't know that there was uh, something beyond a you know, large, I believed, over collateralized margin position on FTX. It was only in the last month that I put together the magnitudes of everything and um, and that I fully understood the you know fiat transfer mechanisms that had been happening. Uh, I wish I'd known it a lot better so, than I had before. So if she's in court and you're in court and she's under oath and you're under yep. oath and you're asked, did you know that these funds were being funneled to Alameda, what is your answer? I did not know that there is any improper uh, use of customer funds. And you can watch more of George's interview tomorrow morning on GMA. Now to the latest on the status of American Paul Whelan, who has been wrongfully detained in Russia for nearly four years. He's serving a 16-year sentence on espionage charges. There have been reports Paul has been missing scheduled phone calls, and Russian authorities apparently have transferred him to a prison hospital. Joining us now for more is Paul's brother, David. David, thank you so much for joining us tonight. Walk us through the very latest information you have about your brother's condition and his whereabouts. 
Well, we thought he was actually doing pretty well. He had been visited by U.S. Embassy staff uh, a week ago uh, on Wednesday, and um, he had had phone calls with their parents since then. He, they, they said he looked healthy. He seemed fine. Uh, and then his phone calls stopped. His last phone call was the day before Thanksgiving, and uh, Paul has over the last uh, three years, almost four, uh, four years in uh, Russian custody, uh, been pretty good about communicating on holidays, about holidays. Uh, so it was very strange for him to miss Thanksgiving. Um, and it was, it was bizarre that he missed uh, our father's birthday, which was today. Uh, Dad is turning 85, and Paul would never have skipped a phone call if he was able to make it. So we're obviously concerned that uh, no, Paul doesn't seem to be where he's supposed to be, which is in uh, IK-17, a labor camp in Mordovia. The prison says that they've moved him to a hospital camp, but they said that he moved uh, at a time last week where Paul would have been able to tell us that he'd been moved and Paul didn't tell us. So we're concerned that the prison camp isn't being upfront about what is actually happening to Paul and where he is. When you have spoken to him, what has his uh, demeanor been like? Well, I think it goes up and down. Uh, obviously, when he hears things uh, such as the uh, White House's offer of concessions to the Russian government that might see him freed, he's, he's elated. He's very happy. Uh, but frankly, you know, day to day, uh, things go by and, and it's not a great place to be. I think he uh, he struggles sometimes to keep that morale up. Uh, and these phone calls are are critical. They're his lifeline to our family, to uh, a future hope of a normal life. And so who knows what he's going through right now, uh, being cut off from that. A White House spokesperson said this morning they are deeply concerned about the lack of information and lack of contact with Paul. What are you hearing directly from the White House? We're hearing the same thing you are, really, uh, which is that uh, they are um, attempting to find out where Paul is. Uh, obviously, when you are put in a prison, you're in someone else's custody. And in this case, you're in the custody of the Russian government. Uh, it's very difficult to get the Russian government to tell you the truth about what's going on uh, unless they want to. And so uh, hopefully the White House will be able to do more than our family could. Uh, we've reached out to the prison monitors in Mordovia to see if they will help us to find out where Paul is. Um, it would just be nice to have someone be able to confirm what's uh, happened to Paul. Earlier in the summer, David, I have to share, I was with uh, Trevor Reed's family when they were waiting for him to come home. He was being released from Russia and was getting checked out at a hospital there in Texas. And obviously they were ecstatic, uh, but they were also concerned about Paul and Brittany and, and all the others that are still being detained in Russia. What was going through your mind during that time when you saw Trevor Reed released? Well, it's sort of like seeing someone get a lottery ticket. You're really thrilled for them. Uh, but then the moment passes and you've got to get back to work. And so that's really what we did. Uh, I was so happy for the, the Reeds, for Trevor to be home. Um, but the very next day, it was back to work supporting Paul and, and making sure that he's taken care of. And and one of the things that is important is, is to know where he is and to be able to communicate with him and to have him communicate with us to let us know if he is struggling with money on his phone card or abuse by prison guards or human rights violations or being transferred to places that he wasn't expected to be transferred to. Right. Now, the Biden administration, they say they're working to secure the release of your brother and WNBA star Brittany Griner. Do you have confidence that President Biden and his team will ultimately do enough to get your brother and, and Griner back home? I think uh, President Biden has done everything he can do at this point. Um, it may be a matter of uh, making some smaller decisions, but he has made substantial concessions to the Russian government, and the Russian government has essentially ignored uh, those concessions, or they have offered or requested things from the U.S. government that the U.S. government can't give them, which is, is it, it, it's bad faith. And so, unfortunately, uh, you know, we're in that pickle that hostage families get into, which is that the government that is supposed to protect your uh, your rights has done what they can, and, and now we have to wait to see if the hostage taker will uh, will respond. And as you all know, Paul's been detained for more than a thousand days now. And as you mentioned earlier, your dad just had a birthday. We're getting into the holidays. Describe for us the emotional toll this is taking on you and your family. It's hard. I think uh, birthdays, uh, holidays like Thanksgiving and Christmas, they're they're fundamental to uh, probably every family who celebrates holidays. Uh, you have. Uh, uh, memories of um, having spent those holidays, those special days with Paul, um, with your special family member, and and to not have them uh, is al always difficult. I mean, sometimes people can't make it back home for holidays, um, but to know that he's in this sort of condition, or in fact, in a condition that we don't know, um, is exceptionally hard. It's really hard for my parents. Uh, frankly, my dad had his 85th birthday uh, this year and probably doesn't have very many more. It would be nice for him to be able to speak to his son. 
Absolutely. Well, David, please keep us posted. Thank you again for joining us tonight. We are thinking of you and your family and really hope for Paul's quick return home. Thank you. Thanks so much for having me. Now to the major step in Congress to avoid a nationwide rail strike. The House voted to enforce the contract that some of the 12 unions voted down and then added a vote on the issue of sick pay that union workers were seeking. So will the Senate do the same? Here's ABC's congressional correspondent Rachel Scott on Capitol Hill. Tonight, in a bipartisan vote, Congress taking the first step to avoid a catastrophic shutdown of the nation's railroads. The joint resolution is passed. The House passing a bill to prevent a rail strike, forcing workers to accept a tentative deal reached earlier this year and avert a shutdown that could cost the economy up to $2 billion a day, driving up the cost of everything from gas to groceries during the holiday season. A shutdown would grind our economy to a halt and every family would feel the strain. Under the Constitution, Congress has the power to intervene in matters regarding interstate commerce and the national economy. But the move is controversial. While the deal would give rail workers their biggest raise in decades, it only includes one additional day of paid leave, and some unions are calling for more. I think some guys are upset that Congress isn't letting this process play out. Jacob Forsgren is a track welder in Lincoln, Nebraska, and a member of one of the four unions that did not sign on to the deal. He is home sick with the flu and hopes his manager will approve his vacation time. Otherwise, he says he doesn't get a paycheck. We absolutely do not have sick leave right now. Today, the House passed a separate measure to grant workers seven guaranteed days of paid sick leave. But only three Republicans supported it, and all of it could face more roadblocks in the Senate. Why should the federal government force a, a contract on workers that they have explicitly rejected, force this on them, and they don't have any say on it? That just seems wrong to me. Tonight, the president insisting the Senate must move quickly and send a bill to my desk immediately. Immediately. Leader Schumer, are you confident that a rail strike will be averted? We're working hard to get something done and to try to get it done as quickly as possible. And we will be watching to see if that happens. Rachel Scott joins me now from Capitol Hill. Rachel, what's the White House saying tonight on next steps and timing to avoid this strike? Well, the White House is making it clear that they want this bill to avert a railroad strike on the president's desk as quickly as possible. They'd like to see it by the end of the weekend. The White House also makes it clear that the president does, of course, support paid sick leave for all Americans, including rail workers, but they do not support anything that would slow down this bill getting to his desk, Stephanie. All right, we'll see what happens. Thank you so much, Rachel. Tonight, tension remains high in China as the frustration over the country's zero COVID policy that has led to unprecedented protests shows no signs of slowing down. Bob Woodruff reports tonight from Hong Kong. Tonight, anger boiling over in the streets despite China's efforts to crack down on widespread protests over the country's extreme zero COVID policies. Chaos erupted as protesters throwing glass and hurling projectiles. Riot police in hazmat suits shielding themselves as they march in formation through the streets of Guangzhou, northwest of Hong Kong. Here on the streets of Hong Kong, there have been these solidarity protests carried by students carrying these white blank pieces of paper demonstrating against censorship. In Shanghai, officers patrolling the same areas where protests erupted stopped people on the street looking through their phones for foreign apps like Twitter and Instagram that are banned in China, demanding they delete any images of the rallies. All this amid news tonight that China's former president, Jiang Zemin, who helped modernize the country's economy in the 1990s, has died. The question now, will his death become a rally cry? for renewed protests. Our thanks to Bob. Now to the erupting volcano in Hawaii. Two new lava flows have emerged from Mauna Loa and molten rock is flowing toward a key highway. Officials are now warning about potential health risks from dangerous gas inside the volcanic smog. ABC's Mola Lengi has the latest. Tonight, lava from the Mauna Loa eruption is now threatening to cut off the main highway that runs across the middle of Hawaii's Big Island. Streams of molten rock from the world's largest active volcano are a little over three miles from the road. This is the state highway, the main artery connecting the eastern and western ends of Hawaii's Big Island that is being threatened by Mauna Loa, likely in the direct path of the lava spewing from the volcano. Officials saying lava could reach the road in as fast as two days from now. The lava is moving at less than a mile an hour, but authorities say it's too soon to know if it will cut across the critical route. 
State officials say they have a plan to close part of the highway if necessary, but that it would create major problems for residents and tourists who would have to find alternate ways around the island. Well, Stephanie, the volcano could eventually threaten property and infrastructure, but right now, air quality continues to be a top concern. You can see some of the toxic gas hovering over the volcano there, and health experts say ash and sulfur dioxide from the volcano's eruption could eventually threaten the air quality throughout the entire state as long as the eruption goes on. Stephanie? An incredible sight there, Mola. Thanks so much for that update. When we come back, the dramatic scene caught on body camera of a suspect hiding under mattresses, ambushing officers. And actor Emma Corrin joins us to talk about remaking a classic for a modern audience. But up next, our in-depth look at what's been fueling the months-long clashes inside Iran. We hear directly from protesters demanding change inside that country. Stay with us. This is ABC News Live. The crush of families trunk. here in Poland. At refugee centers. In Putin's Russia. On the ground in Ukraine. Close to the front line. Here at the White House. Destructive. Cat 4 storm. Here along I-5. Boston is in the bullseye. Let's go. We made it. ABC News Live. America's number one streaming news. Anytime, anywhere. Streaming 24-7. Straight to you for free. Thank you for making ABC News Live. America's number one streaming news. Bring them on. If only there was a place in the morning to start my day. With a smile, somewhere to help me get in the know. A place as spectacular as, well, me. Hmm, I think we might know a place, right, guys? Bring your friends. Oh, wait, there is. Good morning, America. GMA, 7A, every day. Boom. 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 Good morning, Michael. Good morning, Robin. Good morning, America. How are you? Boom. Now that's how you start your day, people. All right, here we go. You ready? Let's do it. Yes, it's the show America wants and America needs right now. This is What Would You Do? <laughs> Let's go. How are you? <laughs> I you. Yes. So what will you be watching Saturdays on ABC News Live? What would you do? Hey, I guess I just found out. <laughs> the What Would You Do Marathon, 12 to 6 Eastern, every Saturday on ABC News Live. My favorite show. So, what's good to read? And we mean really good to read right now. Well, that's where Charlie and Kate Gibson can help. Join us for the new podcast series. It is called The Bookcase with Kate and Charlie. We will make sure you love what you read. Listen, wherever you get your podcasts. So, what's good to read? And we mean really good to read right now. Well, that's where Charlie and Kate Gibson can help. Join us for the new podcast series. It is called The Bookcase with Kate and Charlie. We will make sure you love what you read. Listen, wherever you get your podcasts. With so much happening these days, it's hard to keep up. Things change hour by hour, minute by minute. The historic weather that's now unfolding. The worries on Wall Street. We're bringing you the right now. At a nationwide teacher shortage. The right now look at the day ahead. An alert this morning for dog owners. And the key takeaways from the biggest stories. World News Now and America This Morning. America's number one early morning news. Today does feel a little different. Early mornings on ABC News Live. With so much at stake, so much on the line, more Americans turn here than any other newscast. ABC News, World News Tonight with David Muir, America's number one most watched newscast across all of television. As of today, in a big way, we have inaugurated abcnews.com. A lot has changed in our world since Peter made that announcement. But what hasn't changed is the commitment to groundbreaking reporting and innovation at abcnews.com. And here's to everything ahead. Take a look at this video, terrifying moments for a 12-year-old boy and his younger brother who hid in a closet as two men kicked in their apartment door. You see those men there in the apartment. The children called 911 as the criminals grabbed what police say they came looking for. Five French bulldog puppies worth as much as $5,000 each. They then took off in a car with a fake license plate. The dogs have not been found. 
Today marks the 70th day of anti-raging protests in Iran. Protests that erupted over the death of 22-year-old Masa Amini, who died while in police custody after not covering her hair properly. But the protests have gone far beyond a call for change to Iranian women's rights. Activists are now calling for an end to the brutal regime that has ruled Iran for decades. Since the protests started, more than 400 people have been killed and 15,000 people have been arrested, according to human rights groups. And there are reports of brutal beatings and sexual assaults. ABC News exclusively received video diaries showing us firsthand accounts from people on the ground as they protest the regime. ABC's Maggie Ruley has this story. These are the faces of Iranian women that were hoping for change, but never lived to see it. Capturing what they didn't know were some of the last moments of their lives. Sarina, Nika, and Hadiz are among the many women killed by the Iranian regime during widespread protests that have swept through Iran over the past three months. Their names, their faces, their stories have now become rallying cries for those demanding regime change in Iran and an end to the brutality. The men and women risking their lives today were driven to the streets by the September 16th death of 22-year-old Masa Amini, who witnesses say was beaten by Iran's morality police after being detained for not covering her hair properly, something that's mandatory in Iran. The regime denies that, saying she died in custody due to an underlying illness, a claim her family rejects. But her death has now sparked a movement. Thousands of men and women, mostly young, are demanding the end of Ayatollah Ali Khomeini's Islamic regime. We're scared, but with all our power, we move forward. Aida is one of them. She lives in Iran and sent ABC News video diaries documenting her days since the start of the protests. We're using altered names to protect her and others' identity. I wear a sweatshirt on top because the bullets hurt. I'm wearing these leggings under, but I'm going to wear jeans over them so it doesn't bruise a lot. Aida shows us what it's like preparing for these protests, knowing very well the chances of being hit with rubber bullets or worse. The truth is that I'm not scared at all. Daria also lives in Iran. She's seen firsthand what the regime is capable of. Sometimes we didn't do anything. We just started walking and suddenly they attack us and hurt us very bad. My family, all of them have been beaten with the plastic bullets and you might be killed and you might be arrested. They grab your number plates of the car and that the end. They have done terrible things and we're not gonna let them stay. These protests are in their third month. Protesters are facing brutality and death and violence, yet somehow they keep going on. I think how the young people imagine it is why should we leave the country to find freedom? The previous generations left the country. We want to stay here. We want an ordinary life where women can be equal to men. The quest for freedom has been fought before. In 2009, Iranians filled the streets protesting. Then President Mahmoud Ahmadinejad's victory. Turmoil in Tehran. Iranian riot police confronting supporters of the defeated presidential candidate. Their claim that the election declaring Ahmadinejad the winner was rigged. The shooting death of 26-year-old student Nada Aga Sultan in those protests also sparked a global outcry. But the protests were eventually put down by the regime. <laughs> protests rose up again in 2017 and 2019, sparked by economic issues. But Iranians haven't seen nationwide protests at this level in recent decades until now. 
Do you feel like these protests are different than the protests we saw in 2019? Will they actually have a different outcome? 2019 was nationwide, but it wasn't diverse enough. You, we didn't see enough of the middle class on the street. In the green movement, we saw the middle class, but we didn't see enough of the less affluent classes of the country. I think this movement, it feels like a conclusion of all of these protest movements. You don't see the young generation alone on the streets. You see their parents with them. These protests started because of lack of freedoms for women in Iran. But women aren't the only ones taking to the streets. Many young men have joined the protests in solidarity because they say it's now a fight for the future of Iran and its people. و تو طول این سالها مردها هم فهمیده بودن که وقتی حکومت اقتدارگراز هم زنها رو رنج میده و هم مردها رو و دوش و دوش زنان به خیابان Iranian filmmaker Muskan Ananlu has been outspoken on social media, posting herself on the first day of protests without a headscarf, writing, I am the woman who has come to claim her life back. Be scared of me. I have nothing to lose. من هفت سالم بود وقتی که انقلاب اسلام پیروز شد. الان پنجا و یک سالم شده. و تمام دوران زندگیم رو با تمام حوادث سیاسی و اجتماعی تهی کردم. A month after we spoke with her, she was detained by the Iranian police, where she remains behind bars. No one really knows what's exactly going on in, in, in those jails. There are some reports of sexual harassment. A number of younger prisoners killed themselves after um, being released. Um, torture, a um, number of people on the death row. But what's important is that I think in the past few weeks, it's become clear that this is going to continue. It's a movement that has come at a price. Khomeini's regime clamping down on its youth with strict crackdowns on the internet and social media. At least 449 protesters are estimated to have been killed since the start of the protests. 58 of them were children. And the activist agency Hirana reports some 15,000 protesters have been arrested. The question now, how will these protests end? And will the lack of a clear leader doom it to the same fate as past protests? جنبش هزار سره میگن چرا این جنبش سر نداره میگن برای اینکه جنبش هزار سره یک گروه کور ببینید ما تکنوازی که بیاد به خونه بقیه گوش بدن نیست یک گروه کوره The people rising up in unison singing for freedom for freedom for freedom but will their voices be heard The unrest there taking place for months. Our thanks to Maggie and her team for bringing us an in-depth report. Still ahead here on Prime, the dramatic rise in tech support scams that have led multiple FBI field offices across the country to sound the alarm. Plus, what happened in the moments just before a garbage truck burst into flames? And also, why more and more people are choosing to travel farther for bachelor and bachelorette parties? And how much more it's costing us? We take a look by the numbers. But first, our post of the day from Stevie Nicks, heartbroken about losing the woman she calls her best friend since 1975. Christine McVie, a member of the legendary group Fleetwood Mac. at stake. So much on the line. More Americans turn here than any other newscast. ABC News World News Tonight with David Muir. America's number one most watched newscast across all of television. It's lunchtime in America. So what are we serving up? Well, how about everything you need to know? You got me feeling like your health, your money, breaking news, exclusives, pop culture, and with the biggest stars, music, trends, style, and some laughs and some good food. You got me feeling like... You know, that sounds pretty good. GMA 3, what you need to know. A third hour of GMA in the afternoon. So join us, afternoons, for everything you need to know. With so much at stake in our world right now, we wanted to thank you for your trust and for making ABC News America's number one news. And thank you for making ABC News Live America's number one streaming news. This is where I belong. 
This is home. Real dirt in the sunlight again. I'm very excited. Anything could happen at any moment. My heart is so happy right now. We're making magic. We're making magic. Oh, 200. 200 episodes of Dr. Pole. Oh. Music to my ears. It's been 10 years, and I'm still having the fun. That rocks. He's got the moves that make your animals groove. Now we do the dance of joy. Yay. He's like the Justin Bieber of the night. <laughs> Headlining the hottest barns. Shut out. It's a show you won't want to miss. I'm not going to be here forever. Maybe. <laughs> the Incredible Dr. Pole. New episodes Saturdays at 9 on Nat Geo Wild. This is ABC News Live Prime. Thanks so much for streaming with us. Live reporting, breaking news, exclusives, award-winning, powerful, eye-opening. ABC News Live Prime with Lindsay Davis. Streaming weeknights. So, what's good to read? And we mean really good to read right now. Well, that's where Charlie and Kate Gibson can help. Join us for the new podcast series. It is called The Bookcase with Kate and Charlie. We will make sure you love what you read. Listen wherever you get your podcasts. Weddings are back in full swing as the pandemic winds down, which means more bachelorette and bachelorette parties than ever. And the pileup of events is taking costs to the extreme. Let's take a look by the numbers. A record 2.5 million weddings were expected in the U.S. in 2022, according to the Wedding Report. That's a wedding market research firm. That is up from 1.9 million weddings in 2021 and is the most on record since 1984. As weddings that were postponed by the pandemic pandemic combined with new engagements continue to fill social calendars. A survey by the wedding planning website Zola says its members were planning to attend four weddings on average this year and seven wedding related events. And the Wall Street Journal reports that in the first half of 2022, 76% of brides held a bachelorette party, according to data from the wedding planning site The Knot. And you know, those parties don't come cheap. The Knot found that 97% of bachelorettes in 2021 required an overnight stay mm -hmm, with rising costs for airfare, hotels and food, making expenses add up quickly. One party planning app estimated 10 people as the average party size with the average cost per person at $773 for those attending bachelorette parties. Costs were higher for those who had to fly to a destination as social media has added to the desire of some brides and their parties to have the perfect Instagram worth the event. And we still have a lot to get to here on Prime. Haley Bieber reveals her latest health struggle, an ovarian cyst she says is the size of an apple. And what are Will and Kate doing in Boston? But first, a look at our top trending stories on abcnews.com. much happening these days it's hard to keep up things change hour by hour minute by minute the historic weather that's now unfolding the worries on wall street we're bringing you the right now at a nationwide teacher shortage the right now look at the day ahead an alert this morning for dog owners and the key takeaways from the biggest stories. world news now and america this morning america's number one early morning news today does feel a little different early mornings on abc news live it's lunchtime in America. So, what are we serving up? Well, how about everything you need to know? You got me feeling like... Your health, your money. Breaking news, exclusives. Pop culture, and with the biggest stars. Music, trends, style. And some laughs. And some good food. You got me feeling like... You know, that sounds pretty good. GMA 3, what you need to know. A third hour of GMA in the afternoon. So join us, afternoons, for everything you need to know. This is where I belong. This is home. Real dirt in the sunlight again. I'm very excited. Anything could happen at any moment. My heart is so happy right now. We're making magic. We're today. making magic.
So, what's good to read? And we mean really good to read right now. Well, that's where Charlie and Kate Gibson can help. Join us for the new podcast series. It is called The Bookcase with Kate and Charlie. We will make sure you love what you read. Listen wherever you get your podcasts. Now streaming on ABC News Live 2020. True crime, cinematic, real life drama, stunning, the unthinkable. Follow the clues. The Hunt. True crime 2020. Now streaming on ABC News Live. All right, here we go. You ready? Let's do it. Yes, it's the show America wants and America needs right now. This is What Would You Do? Let's go. How are you? <laughs> Yes. So what will you be watching Saturdays on ABC News Live? What would you do? Hey, I guess I just found out. <laughs> the What Would You Do Marathon, 12 to 6 Eastern, every Saturday on ABC News Live. My favorite show. Residents in the South are cleaning up after an outbreak of tornadoes. At least two people died in Alabama. High winds and heavy rain bringing severe damage to parts of Louisiana, Alabama, and Mississippi. In Jackson, a lightning strike caught on a driver's camera. In the Caldwell Parish area, two people had to be rescued from debris. Neighbors using flashlights to search for anyone who may have been trapped. The Sheriff's Department says multiple homes have been destroyed. Democrats made history naming Hakeem Jeffries as leader of the Democratic caucus. Jeffries makes history as the first black leader of a party in Congress, replacing Speaker Nancy Pelosi after she led the party for two decades. Massachusetts Representative Catherine Clark is elected as Democratic whip, and California Representative Pete Aguilar has been elected caucus chair. Both Pelosi and Majority Leader Steny Hoyer decided to step aside for a younger generation of leaders after Democrats lost the majority in the chamber. We stand on their collective broad shoulders, building upon the incredible work that they've done, excited about the opportunities to advance the ball for everyday Americans as we move forward into our future. Police in Oklahoma City released body camera video of a dramatic shootout with a suspect. Officers were attempting to serve a warrant when they found the suspect hiding in a storage area under the mattress. Once uncovered, he started shooting. Gun. Officers fired back while taking cover. Police said the suspect was later found dead when officers re-entered. One officer was treated and released from the hospital for a non-life-threatening injury. Police in San Francisco will be allowed to deploy potentially lethal robots against suspects in emergency situations. The robots won't be armed with guns, but they would be equipped with explosives that can injure a suspect. Opponents say they're granting police the ability to kill members of the community remotely. The first time a robot was used to deliver explosives in the U.S. was in 2016 in Dallas. Incredible surveillance video from Indianapolis showing a garbage truck exploding after slamming into an overpass. The top of the truck can be seen colliding with the overpass as it tries to drive underneath, sending debris falling, and seconds later, the truck bursts into flames. Fortunately, the driver was reportedly not hurt. The Prince and Princess of Wales have arrived in Boston. During their visit, they will attend several events and are expected to meet with President Biden on Friday. The Royals' main event this week will be to hand out the Earthshot Prize. Inspired by JFK's Moonshot speech, it's awarded to people for their commitment to the environment. It's William and Kate's first visit to the U.S. since 2014 when they met Beyonce and Jay-Z at a Brooklyn Nets game and then traveled to Washington where William met then-President Barack Obama. Welcome back. According to the FBI, Americans lost nearly $7 billion to Internet scams and crimes last year alone. Whit Johnson has more on the tech support scams like malicious pop-up windows on your computer that have been leading to a cascade of financial headaches for some. An urgent alert from the FBI reporting an alarming rise in technical support scams. You may be on your computer and you may get a pop-up. Hey, your accounts have been hacked. Call this number. And they'll represent themselves as a reputable 
software company. The scam resulting in nearly a quarter billion dollars in losses from older Americans last year alone, an increase of more than 600 percent compared to previous years, impacting parents and their children across the country. We know how hard they work for their money and to have it taken like that, it was pretty devastating. How much money did they take from you? Over $3 million. This is for yep. retirement. This is for your children. Yeah. That must have hurt. It really did. Bert, who asked us not to use his real name to help protect his identity, says he was playing solitaire when a message popped up telling him his computer had been compromised and directing him to call a software company. The person answering the phone telling him he needed to take control of his computer to scan it. He says a scammer then pretending to be an agent with the federal government convinced him to transfer money to various accounts at different banks for the purchase of Bitcoin. The scammer insisting that would protect his money from hackers, even sending him a script to recite at the bank if questioned. If anybody was to ask why we're doing this, well, the stock market was down. The banks bought it. Yeah. Over the course of a month, Burt making a dozen wire transfers in amounts as high as $750,000. The scammer, he says, giving him specific instructions. Don't tell the police. Don't tell no. your children. No. His daughter, Carrie, only learning about the scam after the $3 million was gone. Do you ever know if that money was transferred into Bitcoin? They gave um, mom and dad wallet numbers. They never saw it again. And at what point did you get law enforcement involved? The bank manager called the police and said, you know, they've been in here enough times. I really think this is fraud. They handed the case over to the FBI. Hi, I'm looking for technical support. YouTube star Pierogi, who posts videos of his calls with scammers, says his background in cybersecurity has helped him educate the public. He tells ABC he's received countless fake pop-ups like this one claiming to be from Microsoft. Microsoft telling ABC News it will never send this type of alert to your computer and will never ask you to call them, as real Microsoft warning messages never include a phone number. If somebody becomes a victim of a scam like this, what is the first thing they should do? They should contact the FBI through IC3.gov or a local law enforcement agency and or their banking institution. Does it help you heal to try to help others? Absolutely. Thanks so much for that report, Wit. Very informative. Microsoft also told ABC News they take support scams very seriously and are advising that if you see a pop-up alert, like the one shown in that piece, close the window, quit the program by using Control-Alt-Delete, and then run a security scan. Thanks again, Wit. And we turn next to Haley Bieber, revealing her latest health challenge. She says she has an ovarian cyst the size of an apple. Juju Chang has more on the health setback. Haley Bieber opening up about her latest health struggle. The 26-year-old model sharing in an Instagram story, I have a cyst on my ovary the size of an apple, adding, I don't have endometriosis or polycystic ovarian syndrome, but I have gotten an ovarian cyst a few times, and it's never fun. It's painful and achy and makes me feel nauseous and bloated and crampy and emotional. According to the U.S. Office on Women's Health, women form at least one cyst every month as part of the normal ovulation cycle. While around 8% of premenopausal women develop cysts large enough to need treatment, symptomatic ovarian cysts may be caused by hormonal problems, endometriosis, pregnancy, and severe pelvic infections. This is not the first time the Rhodes skincare founder or her husband, pop star Justin Bieber, have faced health struggles. In March of this year, the model revealing she suffered a mini stroke on Instagram, for which she underwent surgery, speaking about it to Amy Robach on GMA months later. I, you know, I had a procedure done to close this uh, hole in my heart and, you know, I'm not having to be on any medication anymore, That's so fantastic. I feel good. In June, her husband, Justin Bieber, revealing he had Ramsey Hunt syndrome. As you can see, this eye is not blinking. Haley sharing that these health battles have brought the couple closer together. I think two things, like going through it very publicly in front of a lot of people, it kind of almost in a way forces you to have to just be upfront about what's going on. And I think the silver lining of it, honestly, is that it brings us a lot closer. In her latest post, the star pointing to her belly with the words, not a baby, emphasizing to fans eager for a Bieber baby that she's not pregnant, ending her post with some inspiration. I'm sure a lot of you can overly relate and understand. We got this. 
Our thanks to Juju. Emma Corrin is becoming a Hollywood powerhouse, best known for roles in period pieces. She's stunning viewers as Princess Diana in The Crown to now taking on a literary classic in Lady Chatterley's Lover. Emma sits down with our Phil Lipoff to talk about what drew them to this latest role and the journey to coming out as non-binary. I spent a good deal of last night watching a lot of The, the Crown, oh, your wow. season. Oh, okay, yeah. Um, and that was a huge year for you. I mean, to tra even, even looking at you face to face right now, uh, what you did in that in that season was in was incredible. Just personally, there were some times where you spoke words where the, your jaw just was so right on <laughs> with Princess. I, 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 it just was so amazing that you were able to do that. Um, before before we get into everything else, I'm just wondering how hard was that to do. Um. Yeah, it was challenging, but it's something that really enticed me. When you do The Crown, you're part of an incredible sort of infrastructure and family, and you have so much, many resources and so much help and support with finding your character, but at the end of the day, it sort of is up to... You get to this point where you've done so much work and research and then just sort of letting that go and letting the words take you to that place. I would imagine there were some common themes that led you into Connie as well. Um, the women are kind of the same. Yeah, uh, you know. sort of trapped looking for liberation. You know what you have? Tenderness. <laughs> <laughs> I, I didn't say you were gentle. I've had enough of gentlemen. Well, they're a different breed. Yeah, I come from the same place, trapped, looking for liberation. Mm. Connie takes it a step further, or yeah. in a different direction. Tell me about playing that role. Um, I just remember being really excited and exhilarated when I read the script. I had read the book and knew that it had been the centre of this huge censorship debate, which is obviously incredibly relevant now with so much literature being censored. And obviously the book is so has at its heart so much about female sexuality and the journey of female pleasure and how it's so central to this woman's story. And I think that that's something that's very rarely depicted on screen, especially in a very genuine or honest way. You were quoted as saying, I was excited to do a role that would take me out of my comfort zone. Mm. Um, how far out of your comfort zone <laughs> did this take you? Um, it sort of did and it didn't. I think the dancing in the rain scene was probably one of the most terrifying things I've ever done in my life. I would think most people would say that. Yeah, I think so. And Because there are things in movies that are like, you know, movie magic. You're not actually experiencing it or actually doing it, and that's your job to be able to... Not fake, but like, I don't know, imagine that you're doing those things and telling those stories. But there was nothing that you could fake about this. <laughs> like no, the it was, you're talking about, you're... You're yeah, dancing around naked, naked in the in, rain in a field. I'm in there, there are you know, cameras and everything. Yeah, and I just remember this real favorite feeling of euphoria as we sort of like share that experience together and completely let go. And we did it quite early on in the sh in the shooting, and it really I think helped us capture that sense of sort of liberation from everything that both these characters were trying to find. Don't you think folks will become suspicious if you keep coming here? Imagine how lowered you'd feel, you, with your husband's gamekeeper. You afraid? I bloody well am. And I want to go back to 2020. Like after that incredible performance, you know, in the award and just all the critical acclaim for what you did with Diana. The following year, you come out um, as queer, non-binary, and and you and you you change your pronouns. So you have this tremendous year, um, and then you choose to do this. And I'm curious, was it just time, or did you feel that you had? some foundation under you that you could or were, I'm just I'm just wondering about that it was nothing to do with time I think I just felt that was just something that I was experiencing personally at that time on the journey of my identity and I would never feel like I could be disingenuous in how I come across in the public sphere of my life I suppose so it just happened that yeah I just I was always going to be honest about it and always will be I've been very open that you know this is I think everyone's identity is a journey and it's you know, I don't know if it's ever complete for anyone, no matter who you are or how you identify, so... But again, with the bravery, social media, having the social yeah. media component to doing that rather than just, say, telling your, your parents around a, a table or a couple of friends, uh, social media is a very different, very, yeah. very different beast. Yeah, I guess it's um, sort of two things. It's 
you know, you have a platform, you have a responsibility, and queer community is one that is so prejudiced against in so many parts of the world and for so many people, especially young people, coming out and finding their voice and seeing themselves reflected in social media because they are so much just such a big part of our lives. And I know that I, how much I looked up to people um, growing up who I could see myself in, reflected in. And You have this career now that is extremely successful and people are, probably want you from all over the place to do this role, do that role. What do you hope people take from this particular movie as you move forward? I think... Um, I hope it starts like conversations about female pleasure, about people's journey to um, finding themselves and bravery. I think that we've spoken a lot about bravery. I think Connie's very brave. And I think also this film inspires a lot of hope about taking risks to be who you want to be and follow that drive and that curiosity to find out more about yourself and follow where sort of that pull leads you. Um, and I think I've been sort of inspired by the character. I certainly feel like it's changed the way I think about you know, striving for certain things and the courage that I have to do those things, so. All important themes today yeah. as well. A yeah. period piece, but also they, they carry through. Yeah, today, right? yeah, totally. Thanks so much for that report, Phil. And finally tonight, as we mentioned earlier, Christine McVie, a gifted songwriter and unforgettable part of Fleetwood Mac, has died. David Muir has more on the woman behind some of the band's biggest hits who made them during some of the group's most tumultuous times. If your life was bad to you, Fleetwood Mac provided the soundtrack for a generation. Christine McVie was their most prolific songwriter. She wrote so many hits, including Don't Stop. And everywhere. She wrote, Hold Me. And Little Lies. Born in England in 1943, the daughter of a music teacher, in 1970 she joined Fleetwood Mac after marrying its bass guitarist, John McVie. The band would sell more than 100 million records. McVie, part of five gold, one platinum, and seven multi-platinum albums. In 1977, their biggest album, Rumors. Some of the songs, the lyrics, famously about the band's internal struggles. There was Dreams. Two of the couples, including Christine and John McPhee, would separate, and Christine would write, Go Your Own Way. Make love and fun. Tonight, Christine McVie's family writing, she passed away peacefully at the hospital this morning in the company of her family, asking for everyone to keep Christine in their hearts and to remember the life of an incredible human being and revered musician who was loved. And tonight, Stevie Nicks posting this photo of the two together and a handwritten note, ending with, see you on the other side, my love. Don't forget me. Always, Stevie. The woman behind so many songs we will never forget. Before we go tonight, here is the image of the day. This is taking that old saying, all in a hard day's work to the extreme. This Kashmiri farmer was pictured braving sub-zero temperatures in cold waters to extract lotus stems. There he is. That is our show for this hour. Stay tuned to ABC News Live for more context and analysis of the day's top stories. Thanks so much for streaming with us. hour we're staying on top of a few things the abc news exclusive the founder of bankrupt crypto giant ftx breaks a silence and the allegation of racism leveled at buckingham palace that led prince williams's godmother to step down from a royal role with so much at stake in our world right now we wanted to thank you for your trust 
and for making ABC News America's number one news. And thank you for making ABC News Live America's number one streaming news. After an extraordinary newsmaking year, thank you for making ABC's This Week America's number one news and politics show on Sunday mornings. You never know what you're going to get on this show. That's all I'm going to tell you. Yes, Whoopi! This mic on? Can you hear me out there? Behind the scenes is always a better show. Absolutely. 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 That's what people don't see during the commercial break. Right. They don't. What happened? I had no idea really what I was getting myself into. That day that we walked out, I, I treasured that day. I just, I couldn't sit there. You're doing good, Joy. You're doing good. Oh, yeah, baby. It was crazy. Behind the table. Listen wherever you get your podcasts. Friday, 2020 True Crime. A 15-year-old girl taken by a 50-year-old man. No one could believe it. Do you think he preyed on you? He did. And he manipulated me. Friday night, exclusive new interviews with those closest to the case. He did, at one point, blame the devil. And the stunning police interview never before seen. 2020. That explosive secret was about to be revealed. Friday night at 9, 8 central on ABC. It's lunchtime in America. So, what are we serving up? Well, how about everything you need to know? You got me feeling like... Your health, your money. Breaking news, exclusives. Pop culture, and with the biggest stars. Music, trends, style. And some laughs. And some good food. You got me feeling like... You know, that sounds pretty good. GMA 3, what you need to know. A third hour of GMA in the afternoon. So join us, afternoons, for everything you need to know. I'm Stephanie Ramos. Thanks for streaming with us. We're monitoring several developments here at ABC News at this hour. The House Ways and Means Committee has announced that they have received former President Trump's tax returns. The Treasury Department turned over the docs a week after the Supreme Court refused to step in and block the move. It's unclear what lawmakers plan to do with the former president's records. And there is promising news in the fight against Alzheimer's. A large clinical trial of the drug lecanemab show it slowed the rate of cognitive decline by 27% for patients in the early stages of the disease. That is huge. The drug removes abnormal protein in the brain, but there were side effects. The FDA is expected to make a decision on possible approval early next year. And our American hero, Christian Pulisic, promised he'll play against the Netherlands on Saturday. He was injured, scoring the winning goal in yesterday's knockout round with Iran. From his hospital bed, he vowed he will be ready Saturday. Don't worry. That is a quote. Now to the severe weather from coast to coast. With 30 reported tornadoes across three states in the past 24 hours, killing two people in Alabama. Rob Marciano reports tonight from Alabama. Tonight, the system that spawned nocturnal twisters across three states is on the move. I'm right inside the circulation. More than 30 reported tornadoes in all. In Caldwell Parish, Louisiana, flashlights piercing the darkness as they desperately search for survivors. At least two injured there. In Alabama, and, uh, just after 3.15 in the morning. It's rapidly moving eastward. So, Wetumpka, you need to be in your safe place. you got this storm approaching from the west. An EF2 tornado, winds up to 120 miles per hour, touching down north of Montgomery, sending trees crashing into homes, ripping apart others, debris hanging from utility poles. This is what's left of a community center. Tragically, that twister killing a mother and her eight-year-old son, a relative identifying them as Chiquita Brodnax and Sidarius Tell. The boy's father rushed to the hospital. I think the tornado really just came very, very quickly in this case. In Utah, Alabama, a different twister making a direct hit on this apartment complex. Look at all this building material just everywhere. Up there, a four by eight piece of plywood impaled on that tree. This is where kids would normally be playing, but the walls and roof of those bedrooms blown out. Amazingly, no one here seriously hurt. Kathleen Jones rode out the storm here with her three kids. So it came through, you heard it, You're, mm -hmm. and, and what you My and your kids- My apartment was shaking. What'd you do with your kids at that point? We, all I could do was just grab them up, and we all went into the closet, and I just told them about it, cover their heads, and all I was just saying, well, God, please help us. That's it. All I could do was just call on Jesus. Their home now condemned.
Let's get straight to Rob Marciano in Alabama. And Rob, the damage is widespread across multiple states, and this system is now moving east. Time this out for us. All right, well, uh, look, it's, uh, it's moving quickly. Thankfully, the tornado threat is winding down here, but obviously the damage already done. The building you see behind me, it's now condemned. It's got hit by one of 10 EF1 or higher tornadoes, and we'll see probably more of those uh, confirmed tornadoes tally up during the day tomorrow. But tomorrow is going to be a different day for just about everybody. Tonight, a different night for folks who live in the Northeast. You're getting the rain and the wind, difficult air travel, difficult driving. The rain will end from west to east tonight eventually, but the wind will not. We're looking at uh, high wind warnings and advisories across the northeast and parts of the Great Lakes. Throughout the day tomorrow, it could see winds gust to 50 miles an hour in spots, and a lake effect snow warning is up off of Lake Ontario, north of Syracuse. Could see it well over a foot of snow as the cold air piles off the Great Lakes, calming down for a day or two. But right now, the next storm up is already pounding the Pacific Northwest with heavy rain and, and mountain snow. Seattle to Portland, down I-5. Winter storm warnings are posted for the Cascades, the Siskiyous, the Sierras, and then through the Bitterroots as this thing will press not only to inland, but I think the front gets all the way down into Southern California. So everybody on the West Coast gets a piece of this. One to three feet of snow in the mountains. And this one has some punch to it and enough legs to it to where it'll be another system that affects everybody in the lower 48. One more that's going to go coast to coast. Stephanie? You're tracking quite a lot. Thank you so much, Rob. Now to the major step in Congress to avoid a nationwide rail strike. The House voted to enforce the contract that some of the 12 unions voted down and then added a vote on the issue of sick pay that union workers were seeking. Here's a question. Will the Senate do the same? Here's ABC's congressional correspondent Rachel Scott on Capitol Hill. Tonight, in a bipartisan vote, Congress taking the first step to avoid a catastrophic shutdown of the nation's railroads. The joint resolution is passed. The House passing a bill to prevent a rail strike, forcing workers to accept a tentative deal reached earlier this year and avert a shutdown that could cost the economy up to $2 billion a day, driving up the cost of everything from gas to groceries during the holiday season. A shutdown would grind our economy to a halt and every family would feel the strain. Under the Constitution, Congress has the power to intervene in matters regarding interstate commerce and the national economy. But the move is controversial. While the deal would give rail workers their biggest raise in decades, it only includes one additional day of paid leave, and some unions are calling for more. I think some guys are upset that Congress isn't letting this process play out. Jacob Forsgren is a track welder in Lincoln, Nebraska, and a member of one of the four unions that did not sign on to the deal. He is home sick with the flu and hopes his manager will approve his vacation time. Otherwise, he says he doesn't get a paycheck. We absolutely do not have sick leave right now. Today, the House passed a separate measure to grant workers seven guaranteed days of paid sick leave. But only three Republicans supported it, and all of it could face more roadblocks in the Senate. Why should the federal government force a, a contract on workers that they have explicitly rejected, force this on them, and they don't have any say on it? That just seems wrong to me. Tonight, the president insisting the Senate must move quickly and send a bill to my desk immediately. Leader Schumer, are you confident that a rail strike will be averted? We're working hard to get something done and to try to get it done as quickly as possible. And we will be watching to see if that happens. Rachel Scott joins me now from Capitol Hill. Rachel, what's the White House saying tonight on next steps and timing to avoid this strike? Well, the White House is making it clear that they want this bill to avert a railroad strike on the president's desk as quickly as possible. They'd like to see it by the end of the weekend. The White House also makes it clear that the president does, of course, support paid sick leave for all Americans, including rail workers, but they do not support anything that would slow down this bill getting to his desk, Stephanie. All right, we'll see what happens. Thank you so much, Rachel. A judge has declared a mistrial in the case of that 70s show actor Danny Masterson. He was charged with the rapes of three women in his Hollywood Hills home between 2001 and 2003, but jurors said they were hopelessly deadlocked on a verdict. The Church of Scientology, where Masterson is a member, played a supporting role in the case with the women claiming it harassed and intimidated them after Masterson was charged. He pleaded not guilty and said the acts were all consensual. Prosecutors say they are now considering what steps to take next.
An emotional plea from a family urging parents to monitor who your children are talking to. It comes amid chilling new details about the former Virginia State Trooper accused of posing as a teenager and driving across the country to pick up a teenage girl, allegedly killing her family and burning their home. ABC's chief national correspondent Matt Gutman has the latest. Tonight, family members pleading with parents across this country to know who their children are talking to online. Parents, please, please know your child's online activity. Ask questions about what they are doing and whom they are talking to. Anybody can say they're someone else. And you could be in this situation. That is authorities in Riverside, California, revealing more about the former Virginia State Trooper who allegedly posed as a teenage boy driving cross-country to meet a 15-year-old girl in person, then allegedly killing three members of the girl's family and setting fire to the house. When I had arrived at my house, we had learned that something more tragic had happened. Police say the bodies of the girl's mother and grandparents were found in their burning home, their hands heavily duct taped behind their back. The 28-year-old Edwards then drove off with that 15-year-old girl, leading police on a chase and a shootout. Tonight, an autopsy revealing he took his own life. The girl was unharmed. And Matt Gutman joins us now. Matt, what are we learning about the teenage girl at the center of this tragic case? Stephanie, for the first time, police revealing today that she had a sister, another teenager living at that house. Both of them are physically unharmed, but um, authorities are saying tonight that at least the sister who was part of that abduction, she is now with Child Protective Services getting treatment for what they say is significant psychological trauma. Stephanie. Understandably. Thank you so much, Matt. Next to the ABC News exclusive with Sam Bankman Freed. He is the founder of the now bankrupt crypto exchange FTX, and he sat down with George Stephanopoulos amid multiple allegations of fraud against him. Take a listen. This is really a yes or no question. Yep. Carolyn Ellison says you knew that FTX funds were being funneled to Alameda. Did you know that? I knew that there is an open margin position there, and that that involved. I know, but that's not what I'm borrow. asking. <laughs> I didn't know that there was. Uh, something beyond a you know large, I believed, over collateralized margin position on FTX. It was only in the last month that I put together the magnitudes of everything, and um, and that I fully understood the you know fiat transfer mechanisms that had been happening. Uh, I wish I'd known it a lot better than so, I had before. So if she's in court and you're in court and she's under oath and you're under yep. oath and you're asked, did you know that these funds were being funneled to Alameda, what is your answer? I did not know that there is any improper uh, use of customer funds. And you can watch much more of George's interview tomorrow morning on GMA. Now to the erupting volcano in Hawaii. Two new lava flows have emerged from Mauna Loa and molten rock is flowing toward a key highway. Officials are now warning about potential health risks from dangerous gas inside the volcanic smog. ABC's Mola Lengi has the latest. Tonight, lava from the Mauna Loa eruption is now threatening to cut off the main highway that runs across the middle of Hawaii's Big Island. Streams of molten rock from the world's largest active volcano are a little over three miles from the road. This is the state highway, the main artery connecting the eastern and western ends of Hawaii's Big Island that is being threatened by Mauna Loa, likely in the direct path of the lava spewing from the volcano. Officials saying lava could reach the road in as fast as two days from now. The lava is moving at less than a mile an hour, but authorities say it's too soon to know if it will cut across the critical route. State officials say they have a plan to close part of the highway if necessary, but that it would create major problems for residents and tourists who would have to find alternate ways around the island. Our thanks to Mola. Could COVID actually be the reason behind the first cracks we have seen in decades of the Communist Party's firm grip on power in China? That's a big question. The protests over the zero COVID strategy continues, and our Bob Woodruff, who is in the region, has more. Tonight, anger boiling over in the streets, despite China's efforts to crack down on widespread protests over the country's extreme zero-COVID policies. 
Chaos erupted as protesters throwing glass and hurling projectiles. Riot police in hazmat suits shielding themselves as they march in formation through the streets of Guangzhou, northwest of Hong Kong. Here on the streets of Hong Kong, there have been these solidarity protests carried by students carrying these white blank pieces of paper demonstrating against censorship. In Shanghai, officers patrolling the same areas where protests erupted stopped people on the street looking through their phones for foreign apps like Twitter and Instagram that are banned in China, demanding they delete any images of the rallies. All this amid news tonight that China's former president, Jiang Zemin, who helped modernize the country's economy in the 1990s, has died. The question now, will his death become a rally cry? for renewed protests. Bob Woodruff joins us now from Hong Kong. And Bob, despite these lockdowns, COVID is still spreading rapidly across China. It is. It's really shocked a lot of people, Stephanie. You know, China has been trying to stop these COVID cases for almost three years now. But this week, they hit the highest number of more than 40,000 daily cases. And despite all of this, today, the Chinese health officials actually appeared to soften their tone, urging local governments to avoid lengthy uh, lockdowns. Stephanie? Incredible. Thank you so much, Bob. Good to see you. And still to come, the popular item just added to the United Nations cultural heritage list and a little known part of World War II history, Jewish people forced into internment camps off the coast of England. Author Simon Parkin tells us about the firsthand accounts featured in his new book. Tomorrow is World AIDS Day. In our new special, Viral, A World Without AIDS, we remember the lives lost to the virus, the lingering stigma, and the strides we've made in the global race to end the HIV AIDS epidemic. Here's a preview of Juju Chang's interview with CDC Director Rochelle Walensky, reflecting on her time on the front lines. What was it like as a physician not having anything you could give them to save them? What you could do was you could give them grace. You could give them comfort. You could give them pride. Were there moments in that battle that stay with you to this day? Once patients, families recognize that they might be gay, that they might be gay and have HIV, many patients did not, have, you know, their families abandoned them. And, um, you know, holding someone's hand. Um, I, I vividly remember Christmas time on our AIDS wards and, you know, delivering gifts, delivering socks, delivering um, those small things made such a big difference in people's lives. And you can watch the ABC News Live special viral, A World Without AIDS, tomorrow right here at 8.30 p.m. Eastern and available the following day on Hulu. We hope you'll check it out. We are tracking... This is ABC News Live. The crush of families here in Poland. At refugee centers. In Putin's Russia. On the ground in Ukraine. Close to the front line. Here at the White House. Destructive. Cat 4 storm. Here along I-5. Boston is in the bullseye. Let's go. We made it. ABC News Live. America's number one streaming news. Anytime, anywhere. Streaming 24-7. Straight to you for free. Thank you for making ABC News Live. America's number one streaming news. Bring them on. If only there was a place in the morning to start my day. With a smile, somewhere to help me get in the know. A place as spectacular as, well, me. Hmm, I think we might know a place, right, guys? Bring your friends. Oh, wait, there is. Good morning, America. GMA, 7A, every day. Boom. 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 Good morning, Michael. Good morning, Robin. Good morning, America. How are you? Boom. Now that's how you start your day, people. All right, here we go. You ready? Let's do it. Yes, it's the show America wants and America needs right now. This is What Would You Do? Let's go. How are you? Can I hug you? Yes. So what will you be watching Saturdays on ABC News Live? What would you do? Hey, I guess I just found out. <laughs> the What Would You Do Marathon, 12 to 6 Eastern, every Saturday on ABC News Live. My favorite show. As of today, in a big way, we have inaugurated ABCNews.com. A lot has changed in our world since Peter made that announcement. But what hasn't changed is the commitment to groundbreaking reporting and innovation at ABCNews.com. Here's to everything ahead.
Now streaming on ABC News Live 2020. True crime, cinematic, real life drama, stunning, the unthinkable. Follow the clues, the hunt, true crime 2020. Now streaming on ABC News Live. We're tracking several headlines around the world. The godmother of Prince William has stepped down from her role as a royal aide after making racist comments to a black woman at a reception at Buckingham Palace. The woman at the receiving end of the comments is British and works for a domestic abuse support group. She tweeted the royal aide had repeatedly asked her, what part of Africa are you from? Prince William's spokesperson said racism has no place in our society. A spokesperson for his godmother said she apologized for the hurt she caused. Brazilian soccer star Pele was hospitalized in Sao Paulo to reassess his cancer treatment. The 82-year-old had a tumor removed from his colon in September of 2021 and has since been in and out of the hospital for treatment on a regular basis. The soccer legend is stable and his daughter shared on Instagram there was no emergency behind his hospitalization. The French are rejoicing as their staple bread, the baguette, has made it into the United Nations cultural heritage list. Although baguette consumption has declined over the last decade, France still makes around 16 million of the loaves per day. That's nearly 6 billion baguettes a year. In the early years of World War II, Jews from across continental Europe were fleeing their homes as the Nazis were beginning to systematically persecute, detain, and ultimately kill at least six million Jews. Some of those who were able to make it out went to Britain, but were forced into internment camps amid wartime paranoia. A new book explores the unpublished accounts of those who were sent to the infamous Hutchinson camp on the Isle of Man off the coast of England. Our next guest is the author of of the book titled The Island of Extraordinary Captives, a painter, a poet, an heiress, and a spy in a World War II British internment camp. Simon Parkin, thank you so much for joining us tonight. Really appreciate your time. This book follows the story of Peter Fleischman, an 18-year-old aspiring artist who found himself among uh, 1,200 other predominantly Jewish captives at the Hutchinson camp on the Isle of Man. For those who aren't familiar, could you share with us a bit of background on the camp? camp and who exactly was detained there? Yeah, so the camp was opened in the early summer of 1940, and it was really a measure by the British government uh, that was concerned that um, the German army, which had recently invaded France, was about to cross the channel and invade Britain. And if they did so, then many of the um, perhaps many of the Germans and Austrians that Britain had allowed into the country uh, in the years leading up to war and in the early months of war, perhaps some of them would have been spies to assist in that invasion, a term at the time known as fifth columnists. So Hutchinson was one of a range of camps uh, around the country and on the Isle of Man, which is situated in the um, Irish Sea, uh, where um, anyone with a German or Austrian passport and some other nationalities as well uh, were sent uh, to be held until uh, the government could establish whether or not they were they were friend or foe, essentially. Simon, this is really fascinating, but given the documented history of internment camps in World War II, why was it not widely known that European refugees were also being detained at these camps in Britain? Well, uh, at the time, it, it was a big scandal. And in fact, there were, you know, Many debates uh, in um, in the Houses of Parliament in London, uh, you know, almost weekly about uh, what many people saw as a grave injustice. The people that were, had already sort of undergone the trauma of fleeing their lives and their livelihoods um, to make it safely to Britain were then being imprisoned indefinitely, without charge, without trial. Uh, you can imagine that for many of those individuals, this was a you know a further trauma that they had to endure. Mm, I see. And to be very clear, these internment camps were very different compared to what Jews went through uh, by the Nazis. But the makeup of the internees at Hutchinson was very unique from professors to musicians, artists and journalists. How did all of these extraordinary individuals end up in this same camp? 
Well, um, I mean, firstly, I suppose the people, the, the kinds of people that were fleeing Germany from 1933 tended to be, you know, artists who were being, um, you know, victimised by the Nazi party, as well as intellectuals, uh, anyone with any Jewish heritage who was being asked to leave their posts at universities and colleges. Many of them came to Britain to make their lives here. And these were some of the people and professions who were who were rounded up and, uh, and sent to internment camps, um, journalists journalists, lawyers, poets, uh, you know, musicians, a wide range of, um, you know, professions. And it, it was through happenstance that really there was just such a high concentration of really quite brilliant people in this one camp on the Isle of Man. Really from the very first week, they organised a weekly schedule of lectures, uh, of um, art exhibitions, musical performances, theatrical performances. And really, you know, it sort of became this impromptu cultural centre, I suppose, as a way to pass the time and also make the best use of um, the internees skills and talents keeping their culture alive as you know over the past few years we have seen a significant rise in anti-semitic attacks did that did you take that into account at all while you, you were writing this book yeah, I mean, it's a it, it's a good question whether anti-Semitism played a role in the internment policy. I think, on balance, uh, probably not. It was paranoia about um, German and Austrian enemy people of enemy nationality being in the country. That was the predominant reason for the internment measures. But of course, the fact that. Um, it had been predominantly Jewish people who had fled Europe and come to Britain meant that the policy disproportionately um, targeted Jewish people. And in fact, you know, around 80% of the people in Hutchinson camp uh, were Jewish. So that goes to say that even though the, I suppose, the impetus for the policy wasn't necessarily anti-Semitic, its outcome um, happened to happened to be. Simon Parkin, thank you so much for your time. Thanks for being with us. Really looking forward to your book, The Island of Extraordinary Captives, A Painter, A Poet, An Heiress, and A Spy in a World War II British Internment Camp is available right now wherever books are sold. Thanks so much, Simon. And still to come, making history on the baseball field, Olivia Pichardo tells us what it's like to be the first female Division I baseball player. This is where I belong. This is home. Real dirt in the sunlight again. I'm very excited. Anything could happen at any moment. My heart is so happy right now. We're making magic. We're making magic. With so much at stake, so much on the line, more Americans turn here than any place else. ABC News, World News Tonight with David Muir. America's number one most watched newscast. Now streaming on ABC News Live. After an extraordinary newsmaking year, thank you for making ABC's This Week America's number one news and politics show on Sunday mornings. Zoo! 200! Oh, 200! 200 episodes of Dr. Paul. Oh. Music to my ears. It's been 10 years, and I'm still having the fun. That rocks. He's got the moves that make your animals groove. Now we do the dance of joy. Yay! He's like the Justin Bieber of the music. <laughs> Headlining the hottest barns. Shut out! It's a show you won't want to miss. I'm not going to be here forever. Maybe. <laughs> the Incredible Dr. Paul. New episodes Saturdays at 9 on Net Geo Wild. Brown University freshman Olivia Pichardo made history recently, becoming the first female athlete in NCAA Division I history to make a varsity baseball roster. According to Baseball for All, there have only been 20 women on collegiate baseball teams, but none at the D1 level. Pichardo, who was not recruited to Brown as an athlete, tried out for the team and made it with the team's head coach calling her a standout and, quote, the most complete walk-on tryout he has ever seen. Joining me now is the Olivia Pichardo. Welcome to the show. So nice to meet you. 
Hi, thank you for having me. Of course. So I just mentioned that you were a walk-on trying to get a spot on the baseball team roster. What were your expectations when you went to the tryouts and then the practices? Did you think you had a shot? Yeah, I mean, um, ever since I knew that I was coming to Brown, I um, was just giving myself positive reinforcements, um, just saying that I'm going to make the team and um, just not having any doubt in my mind. What was it like the moment you heard that you made the team? Uh, it was pretty surreal. <clears throat> um, yeah, I mean, my face didn't show it that much in the video, um, but that's just my demeanor, it's just how I am. Uh, but yeah, it's, it was nice to know that um, all the hard work that I put in really paid off. Yeah, so let's go back a bit. You've been playing baseball since you were a young child, five years old. When did it occur to you, there, there, we have a picture of you up, adorable. When did you realize that it was unusual, uh, that very few girls were competing in baseball when uh, a lot of the other girls were playing softball? When did you realize that difference? Uh, well, when I was little, I didn't, <clears throat> I didn't really see, uh, I guess I didn't see gender or whatever, um, but it started to actually settle in much later when I was uh, 14, um, when, you know, kids start, uh, like, talking more in school mm -hmm. and, um, you know, just getting a little bit meaner, but... Uh, yeah, I would say around 14 years old is when it started to hit me that what I'm doing is really um, out of the ordinary. Yeah, and even those negative comments didn't stop you. None of it discouraged you from, from playing baseball, right? Uh, what's it been like being on the team? How have your, your teammates treated you? Yeah, everyone has been super welcoming and... Um, a lot of them reached out to me after uh, the news broke, just mm -hmm. telling me that they're in my corner and um, they have my support, um, you know, through all of the uh, um, online skeptics that there might be. So, uh, yeah, they treat me just like how they would each other. That's really good to hear. Your college baseball season starts in February. What do you think will be the biggest challenge ahead, not only as a student athlete in your first year, but as someone who will have a lot of the focus on your performance on that team? Um, the biggest challenge, I would say, would just to stay within myself and um, to try not to let the moment get too big and, um, you know, just try to get into a good mindset in whatever I'm doing in that game. You're truly an inspiration. You, despite the naysayers, you stuck with it and you're living out your dream and I, I applaud that. I mean, that's huge. What is your message to other women and girls who want to participate in sports that are traditionally reserved for boys like baseball? Uh, I would say to just keep playing the sport that you love and to not let anyone else affect that decision. Whether you start and stop playing that sport should be solely on your own terms and um, not because anyone told you otherwise. Good advice. Olivia Pichardo, thank you so much for joining us and for taking some time out of your busy school life. We'll let you get back to it and good luck with finals coming up. Thank you so much. And that is our show for tonight. Stay tuned to ABC News Live for more context and analysis of the day's top stories. I'm Stephanie Ramos. Thanks so much for streaming with us. It's lunchtime in America. So, what are we serving up? Well, 